Please welcome Sofia Hernandez, Global Head of Business Marketing at TikTok, where she's played a pivotal role in TikTok's evolution from a challenger brand to a multi-billion dollar advertising juggernaut. She's joined by moderator Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy, for a conversation about capturing multi-generational audiences. So great to see you again, Sophia. Always great to see you, Matt. Sophia and I have a long history together. Uh, Sophia actually used to be at Suzy way back in the day. And um, then she went on to TikTok where she's gonna do great things. So it's always great to catch up and can't wait to hear about what is the latest with you. Yeah, by the way, who knows what song just played or who sings it? Yeah, see? It's very multi-generational. Lots of different people of different ages raise their hand. Somebody, somebody was just walking in here and said, the last time I was at Marquee, I was leaving. <laughs> I will not out that person, but I thought that was probably the line of the day so far. So um, obviously, TikTok is so critically important to any marketer right now. Yeah. And you know, when Facebook was rising, almost before it became a really powerful channel, a lot of people were almost already on it. And TikTok, I think, grew so quickly that a lot of marketers that are in decision-making positions maybe don't have as much experience and or maybe they don't really know how to enter. So yep. if you had to tell a marketer what's the best way to really enter the fold in TikTok if they haven't yet, to set yourself up for success, what would you what would you tell them? Yeah, well, first let me set the stage with what TikTok is and what the opportunity is, because I don't know that everyone truly understands that. So we consider TikTok entertainment, not social media. You don't check TikTok, you watch TikTok. And there's a very different behavior there when you think about Facebook or Instagram, yeah. right? Um, so it's an entertainment platform. The algorithm, it learns what you like and it continues to serve content that you'd be interested in and then it serves you some that you might be interested in, right? So it's this discovery experience for you. You're watching, you're engaged, you're laughing. Sometimes you're commenting, you're engaging with creators. Sometimes you're just sitting back and watching and having a good time. Sometimes you're learning, you're watching news, et cetera. So that is what TikTok is. The opportunity for brands is we've basically created this new level of engagement. And if I'm being honest, we didn't create it. We put out a creative tool that gave the everyday person, so Matt, you could start creating content on TikTok and really take off as a creator because people are interested in your content. So we democratize creativity, we democratize content creation, and now the expectation for brands is Creators, users, everyone on the platform wants to see brands on the platform. In fact, 79% of people say they think TikTok is a place for brands. 79% wow. of people on TikTok are saying this is a place we'd welcome brands. In an age where everyone's shutting off ads, where you like don't want to be bothered, you want to skip, we're actually inviting brands to the platform only if they show up like creators and like the content that you're seeing and be entertained by. So like that is the opportunity for brands today is to really show up in a personal way, make authentic connections with their community and their audiences and not just throw an ad on the platform. Yeah, well that's really kind of the default, right? Is to make an ad and I've always said brands are people, people are brands. So if you're gonna be a brand and you wanna act like a creator or right. play the role of a creator, you almost need to personify your brand. How do you do that? Because I think that's, I think the roadmap makes sense, but executing in that regard and actually acting like a creator is a right. little bit more challenging. So what are the steps that, does a brand just hire creators? What is the best approach there? Yeah. So. You and I have been in marketing for a long time, and I think, you know, just in you bringing up Facebook, I think what we had all been trained to do was take a very data-driven approach right. to creativity, to how we were showing up. Video should be X, you know, time long. The, you know, your content should be X many words. And we really lost this idea of, like, storytelling and creativity. And so what brands should do is really kind of throw away their very safe brand guideline, you know, sandbox that they play within and start to experiment with other things. So if you're a brand that typically shows a before and after, very focused on the science of your product, consider bringing some humor into how you're talking about a product. And we've seen Procter & Gamble do that a lot with their Always brand or their Tampax brand. Um, 
We have some examples, for instance, of brands really jumping in to trends in real time. And what I always say is your brand is being talked about on TikTok whether you're controlling the conversation or right. not. And so as marketers, we have to be on the pulse of what is happening in this platform. And I have to admit, I've been doing this since, frankly, since TikTok started. Um, so I was at the beginning telling brands like, hey, listen to us, we are something you should pay attention to, to now teaching them how to do it in an effective way. And most CMOs are not on the platform, which blows my mind. Because Why? Why do you think that's the case? Because I think there's still a reputation that TikTok is dance and yeah. Gen Z, and I hear a lot like, well, my teen is on the platform, or I've seen that trend because my daughter XYZ. And the reality is like, TikTok is multi-generational. We have 170 million users in the US alone, wow. a billion globally, and it has really opened up this window to everyone to create content. In fact, just to give you an example of multi-generational, a creator named Heidi, um, I don't subscribe to women shouldn't say their age. Like, she is fucking 63. She's incredible. And um, a quick story. She told us that she ran into a mom and daughter on the street, and they both were huge fans, the mother and the daughter. And so this is multi-generational. And when you think about beauty or fashion, instantly they're thinking about younger models, et cetera. But, like, Heidi is a perfect partner, right? If you want to reach a multi-generational generational audience, younger people see her as really freaking cool and older women really resonate with her. Yeah. So you mentioned something interesting earlier when you said your brand is being talked about on TikTok whether you're there or not. And, you know, it really kind of connects with consumer centricity, right? Because ultimately brands are now being defined not in boardrooms where, there, where there's a 30 second spot that they can kind of dictate the narrative, it's being built on the sidewalks. It's being built with people like Heidi, it's being built like her fans. So are you suggesting that brands put their ear to the ground on TikTok, hear what consumers are saying positively, and then extract the insights from that and build that as a foundation for creative strategy? I can give you an example of a brand who does that really Great. well. And in fact, you're gonna have Elf on stage later. Um, Elf Cosmetics, so Corey Marchesoto, who's the CMO, um, she, yeah, woo, Corey. Yeah. <laughs> um, she lists, she reads at minimum 2,000 comments a day on TikTok because she wants to be in the know on what her audience is saying, not only about her own brand, but about the space, what they're into, what they're trying to, because then you can identify a way to really insert yourself. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Who knows uh, very demure? Oh, good. I, love I don't. It. I'm lot embarrassed. Of, you don't know no, this? But okay. at least I didn't fake it. So, right. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> no, you always keep it real. Yeah. Okay, so um, Jules LeBron is the creator. She's a beauty creator. And um, she basically is schooling everyone about how to show up in different instances. So if you're traveling, and it's kind of like satirical, right? So like she gets off the plane and her hair's like this, and she's like, See how I travel, very chic, very proper, very demure. And she ends with very demure, right? So this alliteration of very, very, very starts to go viral and people are picking up and they're making their own videos. Easily this is an instance for a brand to step in, right? And um, she's already partnering with brands, but brands can lean into the very, very, very demure. And right? how do brands go after a creator and say, we want to work with you? Like, is there a a kind of tried and true path to doing that? Yeah, I mean, there are traditional ways to do this. Like, there are agencies, um, which you know from your past, yeah. that really connect brands. Um, and then we have tools that connect brands with creators. Um, we have a creator marketplace where you can, it's basically matchmaking for brands and creators. We fundamentally want to empower creators to connect with brands. That's how they make money. And honestly, that's how brands, can, that's one way that brands can really connect in an authentic way with their audiences. You don't have to figure this all out yourselves. Sometimes the agencies don't even know how to really be on the platform. Sure. Um, so a great way is to really partner with creators. Yeah, so organic versus paid. So do you suggest that brands start to establish yes. a strong organic presence yes. first, see what yes. clicks with the algorithm yes. and then boost that as ads versus just diving in the page? Yes. Okay. And again, so those of us who have been marketers for more than one decade right. know that like the industry had basically killed the concept of organic, right? Organic is dead. 
not on this platform, organic really matters, and it actually allows brands to kind of practice how they want to be on the platform, how they want to show up, and I cannot emphasize enough how much I'm seeing brands step out of their like very safe brand guidelines and start to experiment with things and topics that they normally didn't. So a very serious brand will, might might be funny, right? Um, a brand that's very, you know, let's take Nike for as an example. Nike typically would partner with as, athletes. They're partnering with a magician creator, right? To really bring to life the story of the science of their shoe. Or a scientist, right? And so there, this just like, we are being asked as marketers to be creative again. And I love it. And I'm not saying we stopped being creative, but I know every CMO is under pressure from a CEO, a CFO, to really deliver return on investment. And so we've moved so far in the direction of how can I prove that this is working? And we're kind of leaving behind what every single person is asking us for, which is to be more human, more personal, and connect in a way that I really care about and makes me love your brand. Yeah, and I mean, I think what you're describing is really the difference between advertising and content, right? So advertising is what's our unique selling proposition? You know, we're 30% more absorbent, 50% more horsepower. Let's bottle it into something that we can cram down consumers' throats as 30 second spots, whether they want to hear it or not, right? That was the Mad Men era to the advertising age era of television, right? And now what you're saying is it's really about the consumer. What do they think about when they wake up in the morning? What do they say about your brand when they're not in the room? And what does your brand have a right to play? Yeah. And to create content like you're talking about, I would say it's not just about being more creative, it's also being brave in some sense, right? Because 100%. you have to go, when you're playing within the context of your unique selling propositions, it kind of great, creates almost like, um, you know, training wheels for your bicycle that yep. you know you're not gonna fall yep. as long as you can play within those lines. But content, Nike having a magician, that's outside their brand guidelines. Yes, yes. So it's funny you say brave, and I swear we didn't rehearse this, but we do a trend report every year for marketers about what trends in the industry they should be thinking about. This year, one of the trends was creative bravery. Wow. And it's really encouraging marketers to, again, think outside how they normally operate. And I'll say, I wanna show an example, but I'll say one other thing. The way that we are structured today within our organizations does not work for marketing of the future. You have to have a much closer relationship with your head of legal so that you can move things out, right, at the speed of culture. Yeah. Um, you need to, and I think Susie's actually a good example, you need to like gain that insight, you need to be able to test an idea very quickly so that then you can respond quickly. Um, one example is, who knows about the Four Seasons um, family where the baby said me? No. Okay, there are a few, okay. So, not a creator family, average everyday family, films, the mom's filming, the dad, two kids, he's holding a baby, right? Like the baby doesn't look older than one, like this is a baby. And she says, who's ready to go to the Four Seasons? And the baby goes, me! And people are like, whoa, how old is this baby? That's crazy, like this baby just said me. And so it goes viral. Thank God the Four Seasons catches this, right? And when you think about Four Seasons content, it's very like clean, luxurious, yeah. high-end production. Prestigious, right. Right, so they tapped into that family and they used that concept in their next campaign and they did it quickly. And they basically ha filmed a lot of their, they had fun with it, right? And you, I don't normally think of Four Seasons advertising as very fun, right? It's just like appealing. It's showing yeah. me that. The, so they had their um, staff basically run around and say, me. So like, they're like, who wants to go to Four Seasons? They use the mom's voice and then their staff's like running through the pool area or running through like the lobby or running in a room and they're like, me. And it's just really fun, right? Like the, People are asking brands to be more personable because they want to connect in right. this way. Um, we'll show a quick example of Alexis Batar, which is a jewelry brand. They created content where um, they made up these two fictional characters, Margot and Jules. Margot is an Upper East Side socialite. Jules is her assistant who hates her job, right? Hates being Margot's assistant. And they've done a hundred of these or more, and you've, you don't ever, they're never talking about the necklace she's wearing, the earrings she's wearing, the clutch that she's holding. The price, discounts, any of that. 
but people are seeing it, right? And then they have other pieces of content where they do highlight those, but this is a jewelry ad. This is a fashion ad. And people are so into this content, they're begging Alexis Batar to make more. And by the way, Alexis Batar himself created this content. And they shoot it like very grainy. Uh, it's I production. actually wrote down grainy. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I've been on the set of many, you know, fancy TV shoots with insane cameras and it was shot like a movie, yeah. right? And this was clearly shot with an iPhone. It clearly didn't have a lot of, you know, edits to touch it up afterwards. It was just real. So I think that's the other part. Besides putting away your unique selling proposition, you have to ask the brand to film a TV spot with an iPhone. Their complex internally, the industrial complex of advertising, does not support an approach like that. Yeah. I mean, I talk to agencies a lot, production companies, et cetera, to get them comfortable with this. One of Chipotle's highest, Chipotle, the brand, the, um, the, the food brand, <clears throat> their highest performing TikTok is one that they l literally shot on a phone in the kitchen, not a test kitchen, but in one of their locations of how they make their rice. And people loved it because it's not fake. It's not overproduced. You're showing me behind the scenes. You're bringing me into the real world of Chipotle. And that's when people start trusting brands. Yeah. So when you talk about Nike having a magician, obviously, and all their TV spots are about athletes, how do you see TikTok fitting into like the broader ecosystem of marketing? Because obviously, if it's a standalone, then you don't get kind of that integrated payoff yeah. in the end. So how do you look at the two? I think that from a media channel standpoint, like everything still plays a role, mm -hmm. but what I see happening is more and more emphasis on a TikTok first approach, and I know that's very self-serving of me to say, but it's where the magic is happening because people are so engaged on this platform. They're spending a movie's worth of time on TikTok a day. They are being entertained and they're engaging with the content. So the, the Lexus Bittar example I just shared, if you go into any of the Lexus Bittar content and you look at the comments, you will see how surprised people are that saying like, oh my God, I just watched an ad. That was the best ad I've ever seen. I want more. Can we have Jules do this? And now as a brand, you're connecting with your community. Yeah. So say you're a marketer who fits into the archetype that they haven't spent a lot of time on TikTok, or maybe maybe their kids are, but they're not spending a lot of time. And they've traditionally approached marketing from an advertising lens. And they, you've convinced them, which I bet you have, to give TikTok a harder look. How should they immerse themselves in the platform? What would you suggest they should do? So um, just the, talking about multi-generational audiences, there is something on TikTok for everyone. We call them community talks. and so. People come together over sh like interests and shared interests and build communities. So there is a community called Potato Talk for people who really love potatoes. There is a community called Plant Talk. There's Book Talk, which I'm sure you've all heard of. There's Witch Talk, there's Sneaker Talk, there's anything you could golf, anything you could possibly be interested in, there is a community, which means there is content for that. And so what I encourage marketers to do is and I say this often, not only be students of culture, which we all should be and are, right? And we have agencies that inform us, and, but we need to be participants in culture, right? And so I, it's simple, download it and just start looking through content. The algorithm will learn what you like and you'll be shocked at how well it knows you. Um, and also just search different things and see what content comes up. It really is truly a discovery channel. Yeah, and obviously discovery is at the top of the funnel, but one area TikTok's made a lot of strides in in recent years is the bottom of the funnel and commerce. Yes. So talk to us about TikTok shop and, and what, where that fits in your overall strategy and how brands should be looking at it. Yeah, so TikTok is a full funnel platform and offering. It's not just about connecting with brands at the top of the funnel, but people are purchasing instantly. And it's because, again, they're like trusting how brands are coming to life. It feels like less of a sell and more of a, you know, like, I really think you should try this X, Y, Z product if it's something you, you're interested in, if, if it's something you need, if it's something you care about. Um, and so when you think about the way we're bringing commerce to life, there is a lot of live activity, right? Which kind of leaves no room for fakeness or error, like you're live. Like QVC style. 
it really is like right. that. Um, and then from a shop perspective, we make it really easy to transact. And so that's kind of put into all of the content that you're viewing on a regular basis. And so you'll be inspired by something, but it feels like you're just watching another TikTok. And if you take a creator that has some type of clout mm -hmm. that can come off as authentic on the platform, they've been creating content for your brand, and now all of a sudden they're asking people to buy, I would imagine that's sort of how you're bringing a common thread through the funnel to drive that. Yeah, um, partnering right. with the creators is, a, is kind of the low-hanging fruit way uh, because creators know their audiences. And by the way, when I say creator, I mean everyone from 10,000 followers to like 5 million followers. Doesn't matter how big or small. In fact, like some of the, you know, 100,000 plus creators have such strong connections yeah. to their audience. One thing I will say for brands that are going to partner with creators is they... Um, Creators today are very different of influencers of the past. Back in the day, you can hand an influence, and I'm talking back in the day, you can hand an influencer a script and a product, and they will read the script and show the product. You can keep that mug up for Thank longer. You. Okay, Th thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> um, today, I speak to creators who are turning down $100,000 contracts because they fundamentally don't like the product that they're being asked to promote or they don't believe in the brand. And if they do, then their authenticity and their trust with their audience goes away. Uh, and they see it, they see right through it and they know how special that is. And that's what we're asking brands to do is like really know how to show up in a more authentic way and be comfortable in your skin as a brand and like really bring the, your personality to life. So one interesting thing about TikTok is that you don't really have to have a lot of followers to go viral and take off, and arguably that's one of the things that makes it most appealing for people entering is you can post something and if it's good, the algorithm catches it. Talk to us about like, give us all the secrets of the algorithm. No, just kidding, but, <laughs> but how does, generally speaking, what does the algorithm gravi gravitate towards? Is it a certain length, a certain style? Like, Yeah, so first of all, I don't know all the secrets of right. the algorithm, right? <laughs> um, but you know, what happens is you create content and everyone kind of gets a fair chance. If I could oversimplify this, right? You could, I could. In fact, I create content regularly and I have one um, TikTok about Bell's Palsy, which I had a few years ago, where I just like was very vulnerable and talking about the experience. And I still, till this day, this was two or three years ago, have people responding to that because the wow. algorithm keeps pushing it out because people like it, they save it, they share it. It adds value to their lives in some way. And that's, how, that's kind of how the algorithm learns what's performing and what's not. Yeah. So heading into 2025, so many brands are toying with AI in the area of content creation, yep. both with art and copy. What are some areas, first of all, TikTok is looking at with AI for yep. its business model, and what are some areas that you think are viable for brands to dive into with AI without obviously yeah. being not authentic, which you're saying is the right. core to being successful in the platform. Yeah, so um, we actually launched our first AI creative products this year at Can. Um, I'll start with, in our industry, creativity will never be replaced by machines because creativity comes from us, from our inspiration, from our minds. What I do see happening in the future and what we're doing with our tools is how can we enable creative people to do things easier, faster. It's what TikTok did, right? Like it yeah. was a tool that allowed people to really showcase their talents in a creative way. Production is a lot faster these days. And so what you'll see from TikTok is are more tools that enable creators, enable marketers to make content more seamlessly. Yeah. So shifting gears, we have two minutes left. And you know, you're one of the greatest leaders I've ever met with. Um, yeah. You do such a great job of inspiring people, growing young talent, et cetera. And I would just love to talk for a little bit about your management style and more importantly, your ability to grow young leaders. What, what's your approach towards that and what have you found successful, especially in a high pressure environment like TikTok? Yeah, I mean, I think um, core to anyone's success in our industry or any industry is really knowing, one, what you bring to the table, because that kind of makes you secure what's your own brand pitch. Like, Sophia's a brand, Matt's a brand, what's your pitch? Know what you bring to the table and then show up authentically, which is easier said than done. 
So I create environments in the teams that I lead, and I, you know, I have a global team of like 500 people across the globe, but I think everyone knows that we exist in a, a culture of candor. We exist in a culture where everyone can come to the table and be themselves, bring their own personality. I don't want a cookie cutter environment. And from a leadership standpoint, I like to hire people that have really diverse backgrounds. Like I don't want someone who's been in the same kind of career trajectory their entire life. I like people who have moved around because it shows that they're resilient and that they're creative thinkers and that um, they're gonna be a great contribution to, to the team. Absolutely. So finally, I mean, do you have any predictions for next year in terms of things that you think are gonna evolve um, in the marketing space that this audience needs to keep their eye on? Oh, I didn't prep for this. Last time you asked me this How much right after the pandemic. You prep for? Yeah, last time <laughs> you asked me, I said travel, and you were like, travel, and then we had revenge travel. You nailed right? it. Yeah. Um, Predictions for, I think, you know, like, I think we're gonna start to get more comfortable with this concept of AI. Yeah. I think there's a lot of buzz around it. There's a lot of kind of negative buzz about it. I think there's a lot for us to figure out. Um, but I think we're gonna start to see it more. I use ChatGPT probably daily. Yeah, a lot of people. So, I, a lot, yeah, a lot of people do. I mean, their user numbers are insane, the growth. But I think we're all gonna get a little more comfortable with it and it's gonna be less um, of a jarring conversation. We probably won't even be talking about it as much on stage anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. my prediction. Well, give it up for Sophie Hernandez, everyone.